Here we go. Uncharted Drake's Fortune is a 2007 action-adventure made by Naughty Dog and published by Sony. You probably already knew that. Uncharted became one of Sony's flagship titles very quickly when it released on the PS3, and it lifted Naughty Dog out from their Crash and Jack reputation into something entirely different. They're now the Uncharted Studio. Or the Last of Us Studio now, I suppose. It's kind of impressive though, I still think of Insomniac as the Ratchet and Clank people, even after three Resistance games and two Spider-Man titles, though it probably helps they're still making them. I wasn't planning on playing and reviewing Uncharted, but when I needed to get about 10 seconds of footage for my Tunic video, I decided to capture it myself from the Nathan Drake collection, the remaster that was released on PS4. I got everything I needed within half an hour. But then I ended up playing through the whole game again. Granted, it's not long, it took me about 8 hours in total, but I've a few things on the go right now. I wasn't expecting to do this. Down. So then, how was revisiting the first entry of this dizzyingly successful franchise after all these years? Okay, I'm gonna do the premise now. You probably already know it, but I've gotta do it, just in case. Uncharted stars Nathan Drake, a descendant of the old explorer, Sir Francis Drake, and he's on the hunt for some treasure that his dear ancestor was on the trail of years ago. He's joined by a reporter who's helping fund his adventure, called Elena Fisher, and an old mentor by the name of Victor Sullivan. Unfortunately, he's also being raised to this treasure by some bad people, and it's literally all Sully's fault. He went to his criminal boss friends and said he was going off to find some unfathomably rich treasure to pay off his gambling debts, so the bad guys all decided to follow them and beat them to the punch. What the hell, Sully? So the relaxing archaeology expedition is now an all-out free-for-all. Sure is lucky nobody in this universe will hesitate in shooting someone dead on the ground if it'll make them a dollar richer. Anyway, I'll talk more about the story later. Let's look at the actual game. Uncharted came out early in the PS3's life cycle, and you can really tell. There's something very strange about the way shading was done on the characters at this point. It kind of makes everyone look a little bit like an action figure. This is how it was for the original release too. This remaster was done by Bluepoint, who's known for making some of the best remasters there have ever been. Their remakes are also good, though I do know they have some detractors. One thing that Uncharted loves and stands out with even now is its environments. Naughty Dog wanted to show off the power of the PS3 compared to the PS2, and decided the best way was making some ridiculously detailed locales. Your screen is going to be filled with verdant green foliage for the majority of this adventure, and that is really where the game feels most in its element. Ruins are cool and all, lots of intricate little work done on the stones here and there, but look at this jungle! This was at the dawn of HD, and I remember the vibrancy of this standing out to me back in the day compared to standard def. Colours more than pixels won me over. One carryover from the PS2 days, though, might be this weird transitional phase the motion capture animations are in. Oh, they're good for the time, don't get me wrong. Characters emote very realistically at times, but now and then, things remind me of PS2 era titles. Like, some expressions are super exaggerated, just kind of out of place, as if they were trying to make up for the lower fidelity models. They sometimes snap together a little unnaturally fast, too. I guess, at this point, we've still got a way to go until the modern Naughty Dog. A lot of the game's audio doesn't compete with its visuals. Many sound effects have a stock feel to them, lacking some punch and impact. The music is also just kind of... there. It's okay. I did appreciate that it changes mood depending on where you are in the game. Jungle fights feel more like primal animal roaring, and use a lot of different instruments. But then in more built-up areas, it leans more conventionally. More orchestrated pieces. Oh, The music does its job in accompanying the action it shows, but it's not something I'd download and listen to in my spare time. Yes, the main theme is quite nice, though. 
Moving on, how does the video game actually play, though? There's two main loops in its gameplay, shooting and platforming, and both are... okay. They're functional. But there's a lot of little niggles to both of these that can often drag the experience down. The game relies on cover, as was the style at the time. It works well, but is sometimes too sticky or rolling into cover will just sometimes not take. Shooting is mostly fun, but I can never anticipate exactly where Drake's going to be aiming when I peek out, so it takes me a few more seconds to readjust myself almost every single time. I manage okay in other games, I don't know what's going on here. Hip firing as well just doesn't feel very useful. It runs on kind of a lazy auto-aim around your reticule, so you'd think this shotgun maybe would be good for this, but no. It almost never killed this way. Only if I brought the barrel to my nose could I take a guy out. Does the spread of my shot go up if I'm hip firing? Or does my damage go down? It doesn't feel good. It clashes with how you think it should logically work. Okay, it's worth bearing in mind, however, that I played this on hard. And if I have a piece of advice, it's to not play this on hard. I selected it because I played this a few times back on the PS3, and though it's been many, many years, I thought I'd be more than fine. But really, this was actively sabotaging my experience, I'd say. Some of the enemies will just immediately kill you on this mode. I mean immediately, too. Sure, let's give the enemies the absurdly overpowered revolvers. The ones that kill in one shot. Why not? How can that go wrong? <laughs> I did persevere, though. I know I could have changed the difficulty if I wanted to. I was just stubborn and didn't, so I'm not going to harp on it too much. It's something to bear in mind, especially for me in the future. Good luck to anyone who plays us on Crushing, or that exclusive mode added in this remaster. Speaking of, I'm glad for this re-release they let you aim grenades with the sticks, rather than making you use the motion controls like in the PS3 version. That was so awfully tacked on. It was good they got rid of that. I'm actually surprised they didn't also get rid of the quick time events, as they also felt pointless. Other games in the series dropped them, and there is literally only about four of them in the whole game. It's weird. Back to the shooting. The guns feel okay at least to use. Body shots can take a while to finally take someone down, so I ended up racking up headshots a lot. Though the weapons can sound a little disappointing, the animations of killing people does actually do a lot to elevate the game. Ragdolls fly, and near edges you'll have goons just leaping off of them. That's great. They fly like the stuntmen from the films that Uncharted is very obviously inspired by. Sometimes I wondered if it was too exaggerated, but then I laughed when the bad man went flying and my monkey brain didn't care anymore. Now the platforming, however, doesn't do an awful lot to excite me, as it's basically just walking on a wall. You're just hitting X now and then. Maybe it was more exciting back then, but now it feels quite, uh, trite. Plus, the game calculates what kind of jump Nate needs to do when you hit X, and then he will do the correct jump and animation to make it to that ledge. He can't jump forever, but assuming you have eyes, you'll probably manage just fine. There isn't really a challenge in any way. Even when shimmying along ledges, you'd have to be asleep to let the crumbling holds actually take you out. It's fine, as I've said. It's functional, and you can have these set-piece moments to thrill and excite you while not having to worry about bullshit death too much. But I really wish there was something that would make it just a bit more interesting, more engaging somehow. I don't think it changes that much throughout the series either, but my memory isn't what it used to be. You know, apparently Uncharted 4 was going to have a realistic climbing system inspired by actual rock climbing, where you'd have to judge what handholds to make, whether a surface was slippery, that sort of thing. But apparently it wasn't working out and it got scrapped. Oh well. Back to just mashing the X and moving the stick. I guess one thing the platforming is used for kind of well is hiding treasures in the environment. Plenty of unique doodads for you to find. It is fun working out where they are and how to get to them, I guess. I actually found a lot this time through, despite how long it's been. Some of these are hard to find, so I'm proud of myself for getting that much. They even got the Jack and Daxter orb. Nice. There is actually a third element to the gameplay, which is puzzles. But I feel loathed to even mention them. I like puzzles, and these are basically just reading comprehension tests. 
You will enter the puzzle room, Drake will mention he's read this in Francis Drake's journal before, and then he will flip to the page where you will get instructions on exactly what you need to do. Thinking is not required here, and a lot of the puzzles feel like excuses to just do more platforming. I've already been doing that! I wanted a puzzle! I am left here with logical blue balls. Um, blue frontal lobe? Never mind. None of these elements, though, are unique to Uncharted. A lot of the game can be seen as borrowed from all over the place, and that was certainly mentioned at the time of its release. The game was seen as a male version of Tomb Raider, what with its platforming and puzzles, I guess. But it also has the same cover based shooting straight from Gears of War. Its jungle locale filled with pirates and mercenaries on some uncharted eh, tropical island smacks very much of the first Far Cry game too. And even more later on. And there is no end of movies that one could compare this all to. Now a game doesn't necessarily have to be totally original and can even just copy another's homework if it changes things up enough and makes it fun. But one thing I struggle with in Uncharted is that, for this first game that I played at least, it doesn't do anything as well as any of its influences. Maybe Tomb Raider, depending on how you feel about her later entries pre-reboot. It's still fine. I keep saying that, I know. And balancing so many plates without fumbling is somewhat laudable. These elements make it a pleasant experience, but a pleasant experience doesn't scream the launch of one of Sony's biggest franchises, does it? Were PS3 players just that desperate to attach themselves to any game they could get? That would explain Heavy Rain reviewing so well. Actually, I do think I have the answers to this. Why this game was received well and remembered. And I think the clue is in the fact that I just so easily fell into replaying all of it at the drop of a hat. Uncharted 1 is an excellently paced adventure. It balances its peaks and troughs so effectively that I was absorbed into the experience without even noticing I was. It knows when it's time for platforming or puzzles, and knows the right time to send goons your way. And best of all, when to shake things up with something entirely cool, like jet skis or this jeep section. It's these things that prevent it from feeling like it languishes at any moment, and keeps it feeling fresh. It becomes greater than the sum of its parts, just because it manages to be so engrossing. Take how the game starts, for example. We open with this cutscene of Drake and Elena bringing up the coffin. They banter and chat, and then you get an exciting tutorial section where you're fighting pirates off the boat. With all that fun action over with, we get another scene where Drake and Sully leave Elena behind to find the treasure. And then the next part of the game is so quiet. At first I think it's wanting you to take in its super slick 7th gen graphics, and the cool water physics on Drake's shirt where it dries out over time, but it also wants you to take in the platforming and puzzle elements of the game here, introducing them with a different pace. After going loud in its intro, it's time to get comfy and gently sink into the game. You don't have to fire a gun for quite a while here. At least, not other human beings. That'll work. And as you're doing all of this, Drake and Sully are talking to one another. Everything from bantering about old times to unraveling more layers of the mystery. I ever tell you about the time I pawned a phony 16th century Santo off on Pablo Escobar? <laughs> oh, risky move, but by the time he figured it out, I was. Man, are you even listening to me? Hanging on every word. Uh, why waste my time? You get a sense of knowing them from their chat. By the time I finally had that one shot of the book I needed for my Tunic video, I was already fully hooked. I was ready to replay this. And the game still has more tricks and mysteries it wants to hit you with in this opening chapter to make sure you are absorbed. And there is payoff to all of this. It is some careful and meticulous work that keeps you thoroughly engrossed. I think the characters themselves deserve some mention too, as though you can sum them all up by the archetypes they occupy, they do all have just that extra little bit of spice that helps keep them memorable here. Eh, yeah, most of them anyway. I can never remember this British guy's name. I'm Gabriel Roman.
Nathan Drake is a wisecracking smartass, but also the affable hero figure. He's inspired from all over in films, but in games he's now become the patron saint of the role. But you know, they do get a lot of details right with him that a lot of other games failed with. Even ones also voiced by Nolan North. Drake has a history that we haven't seen in this game yet and it does get to be expressed across the story. The bad guy's hired mercenary leader is a man that has personal beef with Drake, and he with him. We don't know what it was all about, but we don't need to. You understand that these two had a few bouts of annoying and thwarting the other. Drake is even acquainted with the big bad himself, presumably through Sully and his gambling problems. Drake feels like someone who's lived in this world for a while, and all these little things really help you to like the guy. It grounds someone who, ironically, spends most of his time in the air. Sully plays his old mentor role straighter than most, but again, they give him a lot of lines that give him history and character. Boy, they love to play him up as an old horn dog. This is like trying to find a bride in a brothel. Plus, his voice actor, Richard McGonagall, is so great to listen to. I could just listen to him wisecrack all day. Out. All right, Nate, just pretend for a minute that I don't really care about any of that stuff and cut to the chase, would you? Elena is also elevated to being above just a simple love interest. Despite being a measly reporter, when shit's going down, she isn't afraid to pick up a gun and start blasting. Point and shoot, right? Heck, she's the one who's saving Nathan at one point. Though, she does get kidnapped later. Oh well. I've got other points, but technically it's in spoiler territory. I'm sure everyone who cares has probably already played this, it's been so long, but this is your courtesy spoiler warning anyway. Go to here if you want to just skip to my conclusions. Now that whoever has gone, can I just ask if anyone actually believed Sully died at the start of the game? Even Nate and Elena get over it immediately. Haha, <laughs> my mentor and longtime partner was just shot in front of me. Wanna go on another adventure with me? Sure thing, I'll bring my camera so we can film my death. The most interesting part of the story for me, revisiting all of this, is seeing how things are compared to how they ended up later on in the series. I mentioned Elaine is pretty headstrong, and there's a moment where she and Nate are running for their lives, and Drakey Boy is just done, and trying to convince Elena that they should leave and go home. But she is the one who wants to stay and go for the treasure. Fine. It's me, okay? I am quitting. Are you coming or not? So that's it. You're just gonna forget about the treasure and forget about Drake? She is so enthralled by the excitement of this news story, I guess. She's completely in on this. I had completely forgotten about this. And considering where things ended up in Uncharted 4, it surprised me somewhat. I wonder if something might have happened that maybe made a change for our girl here. This video is sponsored by the Infinity Gun. Never reload. Ever. You don't even have to aim it, just keep shooting. You have to pull the trigger for every one of these shots. So yeah, I got a massive cramp doing this. <laughs> Whatever works. So after fighting through endless enemy platoons, Drake finally begins to close in on the treasure, but learns that it bears a terrible curse. Jesus, what is that? We're dead! We're all dead! <laughs> <laughs> Remember when I compared the game to Far Cry 1 earlier? Well, instead of Trijans, we have Spanish colonialist ghouls. Although, I'm not sure ghouls is quite the right term. Sure, they look like ghouls, and they have nifty creepy ways of moving around, and sure, they're just mindlessly attacking anyone in their territory, presumably to eat them. That all seems right, but... You know, there's this one part earlier on foreshadowing them, where apparently they've been laying traps around the island made from the wreckage of our plane. They make traps? And quickly and recently. That isn't represented in the hordes I have to mow down here. And if they can make tripwire spike traps with wreckage from a plane, couldn't they also do more? Like even use guns, maybe? Or are their hands too messed up to pull the trigger? Uh, I'm feeling I'm making this out to be a bigger deal than it really is. It's just something that kind of bothers me. We never see them doing anything crafty once they're revealed. Just falling straight into my bullets. So I guess this moment really is just to enhance the mystery on this island? Oh no. 
I'm in the mystery box again. We do get this great line about them at the end, though. Jesus, where are those things? It's the Spaniards, Sully. They never left. Love it. Real schlock. Feels like a line for the trailer. So with the boring British bad guy replaced by his right-hand man Navarro, whose name I actually remember, and also the fact he's voiced by Robin Atkin Downs putting on a bit of Latin flair, Drake hitches a ride to save the day, beginning the final level, which is also the worst level. It's technically a boss fight, but this is from the era of games where quote-unquote realism was being pushed heavily by the industry. And you can't have big tanky regular humans as bosses. That makes no sense. So then we were getting these strange encounters like this that are so over-designed, they end up frustrating. On starting, Nate is ambushed by Navarro and his goons. You cannot shoot Navarro. He is purely scripted, you're not allowed. And if you do, nuh -uh, it doesn't count. What you've got to do is go to each mini arena kill all his goons, see him run away to the next area, and repeat. Navarro will shoot wildly a few times and then perform a deadly shot that is a one-hit kill. So you better have cover when that goes out, you can't just ignore him. There's three of these arenas, and the first and third ones aren't too bad, but the second one has almost only destructible cover, meaning you can run out of hiding places very easily and be killed. But not only that, this arena also has more enemies spawning in than any of the others! Make sure you do not run out of ammo. Collect all you can from that first area before moving on, because if you run out, you can't go pick up the bullets from the goons on the other side. Cross the halfway point, and Navarro will instantly kill you. You can make him run away early if you break the cover that he's hiding behind, but is that really a smart choice? Ignoring all these guns firing on you to instead slowly shoot a box until it breaks? Yeah, I'm not so sure. Again, don't play this game on hard. It's not worth it. I was actually going to replay 2 and 3 after this, but this level just took it all out of me. Anyway, then you hide from him again, punch him, punch him again, and he dies. Well, that doesn't really kill him. This does. Adios, asshole. And we get our picturesque ending. Elena and Nate have a cute little romantic moment, Sully comes in with a big boatload of non-cursed treasure, and we tease the adventures to come. There'll be other stories. You still owe me one. I'm good for it. Oh, good for it, huh? Well, how many are you good for, Drakey boy? So, Uncharted Drake's Fortune is honestly a little bit weak to revisit, certainly on a mechanical level, but I think with the right pair of eyes you can see why this series took off. Take a step back and it's exciting, and easy to fall into, even if the technical details aren't as polished as they could be, and indeed will be. The game leaves an impression despite not excelling at any one thing in particular, and even if it frustrates, it still took me on a ride that I stuck with despite not planning on doing so. I think Comfort food is the best way to describe it. There's nothing wrong with something like that now and then. I may prefer something else that does more for me, but I enjoyed it overall. So yeah, I do recommend this bag of crisps, or chips, or however you call it. You can buy the Nathan Drake collection of the first three games on PS4, but I think it's also part of the PS Plus thing now. It's weird they haven't ported this to PC, but they did for the last two games in the series. That is, that is so weird, why would you do that? I'll probably go through the other two games in the collection at some point, but it won't be until I've recovered somewhat. I've got other ideas to handle until then. See you next time. Nathan Drake, Kill Count, 992.